This is a Macintosh. It comes from a little company called Apple. Apple was started in a small town in Northern California by two friends, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. United by their common interest in technology and dissatisfied with the attempts at personal computers by others, they knew they could do better and set out to make the world's first good personal computer in the form of the Apple I. The Apple I became the Apple II. The Apple II became the cornerstone of an industry that would change the world. In 1984, Apple introduced Macintosh, and Macintosh thrusted the industry forward into a new era. Its style and ease of use gave computers to the rest of us and inspired the next revolution in computing. But dark times followed, and Apple slipped into the background of the computer industry. In the late 90s, a reinvigorated Apple would return to shake things up once again and push the envelope of design and engineering. Whether you know it or not, these events have changed your life. Okay, so this is the story of how I was introduced to Macintosh unintentionally. My first Macintosh was an SE with a 30 megabyte hard drive. The first Mac uh, I used was, was my dad's um, classic and a Mac classic, a Mac Plus. First Macintosh I purchased was on the day of the introduction. But I had a, an Apple II in 79. And then I had an Apple III, and then I got to play with a Lisa in 1980. Uh, I had a blue and white G3, had a Lombard power book, had a Pismo power book, had a titanium power book. Uh, I was given a Macintosh 128 as one of the you know, first hundred people in the Mac division. The first computer that we had, the LC, right, which I had to take away from you because you told me it was gonna cost $2,500. I gave you my credit card, $3,500. So it had two floppies in front and a 30 meg hard drive, and I thought I was in heaven. I mean, how could anybody ever use that much hard drive space? Uh, after the introduction, we were so keyed up, we couldn't really go back to work. So that afternoon, we drove around to the different computer stores in the Bay Area um, trying to purchase a Mac. The first one I owned, the first one I bought with my own money was a 7200. And I bought an expensive monitor, and it cost me about three and a half thousand dollars. Got my aluminum power book. I had a dual 800 G4 with a super drive. I've got my G5 at home. I stopped counting. Yeah, you ended up spending 7,000, so I had to go and retrieve the computer from you and get it back. And it was like a lot of money. <laughs> I had to borrow it off my mom, and it took me years to pay it back. If you think about it from 84 to 2007, you know, that's 20 something years. I've probably had 50 Macs. And basically, I've had a Mac since April of 84 and pretty much have had almost every Mac in my hands since then. So that's how I was introduced to Apple. I had to go and get it from you and retrieve it from you because you had spent too much money on my credit card. It was the hardest thing I ever did in my life. I had to go and retrieve the computer from my own son. Yeah, it was pretty hard, man. It was not easy. Okay, all right, all right. So that ends that discussion, okay. All right, so we're gonna move on now. Okay, bye. Apple was founded twice, and each time there were three founders. Two of them were Waz and Jobs, but the third one, in both cases, is not extremely well known. In the first case, it was this guy named Ron Wayne, who was just sort of a smart, general purpose guy. He, being artistically inclined, uh, drew that first uh, Newton logo that uh, the Apple Computer Company, not the corporation, had. The logo essentially was my own idea. They had hit upon the idea of using the name Apple for Apple Computer. 
once they had done that, and if you have an original idea and you have an apple, and you, the two simply fall together, the uh, uh, classic story of uh, Newton and the apple. And so it was that I sat down and thoroughly enjoyed myself with uh, uh, India ink and, and pen and illustration board and went ahead and created this image of Newton with the apple indicated above in a, a detailed windblown ribbon that had the Apple Computer Company on it. And around the border I had put in the philosophical comment, mine forever voyaging through strange seas of thought alone, which of course comes from the Wordsworth uh, sonnet. And that last line seemed to fit perfectly with the whole concept of this wonderful new product that was going to make the foundation of a new company. Apple was founded again, though, uh, as a corporation in 1977. The third founder was Mike Markla. It's a little more well-known than uh, Ron Wayne. When Apple came out, they were building the Apple Ones in the garage. The Apple One had the ability to have a keyboard attached directly to it and a computer monitor attached to it instead of lights and switches. You could actually have your own interface right there. It was, it was a groundbreaking technology. Wozniak had designed this genius piece of engineering, but he had no idea how to sell it. He wanted to give it away. What kind of crazy idea is that? So Jobs is the one who figured out this thing should be sold. What Woz said recently, I, uh, I think he said, well, you know, I don't want credit for designing the first personal computer. I just want credit for designing the first good one. Rumor has it that Jobs hated the Apple One. I've heard numerous stories that, that it, it didn't work properly all the time and there was issues with it. So they were encouraging and, and promoting the Apple II. So what they were doing is they were giving discounts on Apple IIs if you traded in your Apple One. Sometimes they would do an outright swap. So they, they wanted them off the market. Then they were getting bandsawed in half. But there was supposedly uh, 200 boards made. Now, not all of those were sold. Uh, I hear Waz has some in storage, who knows how many, you know, maybe a half dozen or so. Value, uh, I've heard as high as 50,000 for one, but a perfectly running one in a case is gonna fetch more. if It's got the cassette and the manuals and all that stuff. I started doing my research on, on the Apple Ones and, and the value of them. Pr pretty much realized I could never afford one. And I had gone to uh, the user group website, Apple Fritter and talked to some people and there was discussion about making a replica of one and, and nobody really stepped to the plate so it was a lot of research. I've still to this day never seen an actual Apple One in operation. A lot of it electronically I could figure out. Some of it visually there was no way to tell without you know asking people so I had to interview owners or previous owners of Apple Ones to see hey what does the cursor look like? Is it solid? Is it blinking? It's authentic and it's true to its memory locations and it's functioning. It will completely operate just like the Apple One. There was no such thing as a production case for it. Most Apple Ones that you see in a wooden case were something somebody built on their own. I had tried getting a hold of somebody from Apple and you know, saying, hey, this is what's going on. Can I get permission to use the source code? And I didn't hear anything back. so. Uh, I tried to get a hold of Woz through his website and next thing you know Wozniak had written back saying you know go ahead and use the source code I think it's a you know a, a noble idea Apple probably wouldn't let you but the worst thing Apple could say was that it was mine long before there was an Apple computer he had um, given out the source code schematics and everything at the homebrew computer clubs long before Apple existed so it was pretty much his source code to give out I guess yeah they're kind of an unlikely uh couple and unlikely pair to, uh, you know, Steve Wozniak was the hardware genius. He's kind of a blue collar hacker, interested only in the engineering. Uh, Jobs is the salesman, the slick, smooth talker, good looking young guy. You got to remember the Apple II were, were designed essentially by kids who didn't have any success behind them. And Woz is like a hero, the, the great nerd hero of our times. I mean, every geek and nerd 
Revere's was. He is, you know, a living legend, a, a demigod, a, a god amongst men. Not only for his genius, but just for that sort of that purity of hacker spirit, you know, that the, the generosity of his genius, the the idea that he's not motivated to enrich himself. You know, he wants to build astonishing things, and he did. This was more the apple tree was more like a work of art. It was whimsical. It was outrageous. The some of the techniques uh, in the ROM, and so as I worked my way through it, I I thought. Who would design in such a style and why? And it, it, it's just the greatest thing I'd ever encountered. It was very much like uh, reading a great novel from an author you've never heard of or hearing a great piece of music. It, it uh, captivated me. One of the biggest success stories, I guess, would have to be what was known as Team Number One. Team Number One was the original franchisee of the Team Electronics chain. Team Central was the central organization of all the Team Electronics stores, some 100 stores, mostly in the upper Midwest, and uh, it continues to operate this day. They've now changed their name to First Tech with the demise of the Team Electronics stores. But to my knowledge, that would make them the longest continuously running uh, Apple reseller in the United States. There's oh, more got, back there. Got a bell and owl. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we ever want to fly this. It's probably not uh, not flight worthy. Oh, <laughs> well, is it it probably is, but it's just too valuable. You oh know? yeah. Back in 1977, I convinced my boss at the time I was working as a buyer for the Team Electronics chain. Uh, which was headquartered here in Minneapolis, convinced him to let me go to the first annual West Coast Computer Fair. Out there I discovered a number of companies. I'd gone to look at the processor Sol machine. I was already aware of the Altair. Discovered a little company called Apple who had a pretty good sized booth right inside the front door. Struck up a conversation with a gentleman who told me that they really weren't producing yet. It would probably be later that year, October or something like that. The gentleman uh, seemed quite knowledgeable and, and once he found out that I was a buyer for a chain of electronic stores was very interested and it turned out the person I was talking to was Mike Markola. Mike proceeded to talk to us about the program over the coming months. We put together agreements and whatnot and in the end he grabbed one of the first machines to come off the line, put it in a bag, jumped on an airplane and brought it to Minneapolis. This was that machine. And you'll notice that the bag does not have a bite out of the apple. I don't know if that was a mistake on the part of the people who produced it or more likely uh, that it was produced early on before Apple decided taking the bite out of the apple would make it uh, more registrable, if that's a word. And this is the original brochure that came with the Apple II or for the Apple II. It's very simple, has an apple on the cover. And if you'll notice on the wall beside us, there is a photo uh, that looks suspiciously familiar. I was given one for Christmas by Mike Markola. I'm told that their banker at the Bank of America got one, and that there was a third one at Apple. And to my knowledge, uh, there are probably only one or two in existence any longer today. Remember the computer was fairly expensive. In fact, I happen to have an October 1977 price list. And a computer system with 16K of RAM, which was what we typically sold it at, was $1,698. Now, you can have a, a good chuckle today, 16K was $540. So to outfit a machine completely would take you up to about $40,000. These are the pieces of software that were available originally with it. There was a checkbook, home management cassette. There was the breakout game, which was a little bit like uh, Pong a Star Trek game, and high-res graphics routines. And that was what you could get with it at this point in time. That was every piece of software Apple had. And then this is the, the this, real deal. This is the real deal. It's a used computer. It was actually used, but here's the key. 
There's the serial number. And as you can see, this was serial number five, fifth machine to ever come down the line, assuming they put stickers on one through four. This machine was in regular use past the introduction of the Macintosh, so probably up until 1984, 80, no, 86 or 87, this machine was in regular use. So basically, you had this before anybody else did. Yes, uh, we, I guess I have to say I identified the potential of the product we were the first dealer slash distributor that Apple ever had. Um, I wrote Apple's first distributor agreement, which was liberally plagiarized, I mean, inspired by a pioneer car stereo agreement. Uh, went through and defined the terms and, and what would be done and sent it back and Apple had their lawyers take a look at it and we signed it and we were the first ever Apple dealer Macintosh began with Jeff. Jeff Raskin was a professor at UCSD. Jeff was a music professor as well as a computer professor. Jeff was hired at Apple to um, start the pubs department at Apple. Jeff is a great writer. He was always uh, just had a great sense of humor, was really articulate, um, had a great rebel attitude. In I believe February 79 was the very beginning of the Mac project where he approached Mike Markla uh, to ask to talk about his ideas about a low-cost, easy-to-use computer. And so he started writing a series of papers, uh, later became called, I guess, the Macintosh Papers. Uh, and then around the fall of 79, uh, he, Mike Markla was, able, was impressed enough with the papers that he gave him some budget to pursue starting a project. Jeff needed, needed hardware for, for a prototype. Jeff had sort of the basic idea of the hardware spec'd out. He had the notion of the bitmap display, which was, of course, crucial to, to it being a Macintosh. But anyway, he needed to find a hardware designer, and Bill Atkinson had run into Burl, who was working in a service department. Bill had seen glimmers of Burl's genius. He introduced him to Jeff as, here's the guy who could design your Macintosh for you. Jeff said at the first moment, we'll see about that. Jeff was very proud himself, and but he quickly, to Jeff's credit, he quickly saw Burl was the, the man to do the job. The project really took on reality when Burl did his first design over Christmas vacation at the very, very end of the decade. I think that's a notable point about the Mac that writers don't really make. It was really born uh, with the 1980s uh, because it was designed right, right at the cusp of the decade ending. But meanwhile, uh, once he got that going, Steve Jobs got wind of it, uh, as well as other people at Apple, that, boy, uh, there, here's this, this, this board that is one-third the price of the Lisa that's twice as fast. That's amazing. The most common inspiration, clearly, was, uh, was the Apple II. Steve Jobs was even explicit about that, telling us we were reincarnating the Apple II for the 80s. I realized, uh, as we were trying to complete the software that, boy, the Mac uh, was, was so heavily graphics-based, um, we needed someone who was uh, a world-class graphic designer. I had uh, basically asked Susan uh, to come as my date to a few of the Macintosh parties we had. That was kind of the first connection. Uh, and she met some of the team and really liked them, and so I proposed that she work on it, but the Mac prototypes were too rare to get her one. Uh, so I first started her off with graph paper, went and just bought, a, bought some pretty fine graph paper and told her to make drawings uh, by filling in the squares or not. And she did some fantastic work uh, uh, doing some drawings that way that I think I still have somewhere. And so I showed them to people on the team and they said, boy, yeah, she's good. And those original Mac team members to this day are, are my best friends, uh, my extended family. I would do anything for them. Apple, consciously or not, positioned itself as an alternative to um, IBM, which represented the establishment, you know, the government, big corporations. In 1977, Apple, a young, fledgling company, 
invents the Apple II, the first personal computer as we know it today. IBM dismisses the personal computer as too small to do serious computing and unimportant to their business. And this was at a time post-Watergate, late 70s, um, people were very suspicious of the government and what it represented. And the PC, the personal computer was a revolution in computing. And at the time there was a utopian mindset the idea that technology, especially personal computer technology, would enable people to throw off the shackles of society and foment a technological revolution. IBM enters the personal computer market in November 81 with the IBM PC. It is now 1984. It appears IBM wants it all. Will Big Blue dominate the entire computer industry? The entire information age? Was George Orwell right about 1984? Hello, I am Macintosh. It sure is great to get out of that bag. And accustomed as I am to public speaking, I'd like to share with you a maxim I thought of the first time I met an IBM mainframe. Never trust a computer you can't live. out of Apple, but he dropped out of Silicon Valley and he taught high school for 10 years. He volunteered in, you know, the local high school to teach kids engineering and computer science. When Apple lost Steve, they lost their way to some extent. They became a shadow of, of what they were. System, or you know, they should be making the Newton and trying to do the next big thing. Well, I think the main thing that touched most people is at the time all the press was bad about Apple. Apple's gonna die. Macintosh's market share was slipping. There's no software. There's no hardware. Everything was you know coming off blue. My first job at Apple was software evangelist. So my duties were to find developers or meet with developers and convince them to write Macintosh versions of their software, uh, as well as hardware manufacturers so to create peripherals and stuff. So uh, it was basically to proselytize Macintosh to the third-party developer community. Well, the first time I was there, we were going to change the world, right? We're bringing out Macintosh for the first time, no one ever had seen it changing the world. The second time, obviously the world had been changed. <laughs> uh, perhaps the world had been changed uh, by adopting Windows too. So the second time was much more dire, sort of um, digging yourself out of a hole. The first time was just, it was like being paid to go to Disneyland. Uh, the second time was more like, you know, Vietnam. <laughs> Although I wasn't in Vietnam and so that kind of trivializes it, but you know, it was a war. The second tour of duty came when Apple was supposed to die again. So every 10 years ago Apple's supposed to die and I went back at the height or depth of, <laughs> of these uh, problems uh, basically to ensure that the Macintosh cult remained vibrant and alive and cared for. And so, because I couldn't really control any medium, I started a, an email list server, which had at its peak about 44,000 subscribers. And it was only good news. So, one could make the case that I was blogging before anybody else knew what blogging was. I just didn't know it. So I had a very big list, 
44,000 for, uh, you know, even today, 44,000 would be a big, big list, but it was very big back then. And I would just push out good news and, and it became a source of information so that software developers would send us notices and special offers and all that. And then we'd push it out to the community and the community would then push it out to the rest of the people. A Guy Kawasaki um, law is sales fixes everything. So when you have great sales, everybody gets along, life is good, everybody's a visionary, every, you know, everybody thinks good, right? When sales sucks, everything sucks. So sales were sucking. So Apple was divided into factions. There was the Jean-Louis Gasset faction, and there was the Bill Campbell faction. Campbell believed in marketing, Gasset believed in engineering. Pick one. And that kind of tore the company apart. And the reason why I survived all this is because I never really joined either camp. I got along with Scully and I got along with Jobs. I got along with Emilio. I got along with everybody. One of the reasons is because I never wanted any of their jobs. Right? So Scully wanted to be Steve. Gesse wanted to be Scully. Bill Campbell wanted to be, I don't know who he wanted to be, but you know, that's one of the things that's pathetic about Silicon Valley is everybody wants to be something they're not. And if you're the venture capitalist, you want to be the entrepreneur. If you're the entrepreneur, you want to be this. Me, I just want to be a hockey player. Okay, so everybody wants to be something they're not. And, and at the time, that was rampant at Apple. When I got started was 1979, when I took spare parts and built an Apple II. And then I tried to figure out how I could attach musical instruments to the computer, which um, led to why I needed to learn how to write code, which led to quitting college, which then led to um, getting a job. And, and then over the years, that turned into getting hired at Apple. So I was sort of informally in the QuickTime group as I was a formal member of the um, OS team, although I didn't really report too well into that group. We were always kind of a renegade kind of a group, but we got shit done. But the work was really the sound manager, which was this complete rewrite that ended up fixing a lot of problems and ported it from all this nasty assembly code and rewrote it in C and like made it actually go like 10 times faster. And then right about the same time that we got the sound manager working, I started working inside of the moonlight hours over in the forbidden zone of um, what the QuickTime guys were doing. They were hiding out in the networking building. And the original idea was, now we've got these CD-ROMs. They're not just bigger floppies. What can we do with them? I know, let's make movies. And so that's where the postage stamp movie idea came from was, you know, you couldn't put one on a floppy, but you could put one on a CD-ROM. So, you know, taking advantage of the new media. And so that was the basic idea for QuickTime. And then that invented all these other ideas of how do you compress audio, how do you compress video, how do you stream it, how do you play it, how do you synchronize it, how do you do all these things in real time, how do you control it, and, you know, and then QuickTime turned into this entire industry based upon that basic idea. The people on the outside think that, you know, it's like this wonderful world of Oz or Disney going on and all of us are just all these brilliant, amazing, happy people and like it's not. It's like a sausage factory, man. You really don't want to know how this stuff happens. A lot of it is just bad arguments and politics and working around the rules and, and, and not doing the right thing and apologizing for it later and getting fired a few times. I mean, that's how things got done. It's definitely like, you know, don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain. 
You know, there's a lot of that kind of stuff, and like, you really want to know how this stuff is built. And to me, it's embarrassing. Like, there's there's always big flaws to a lot of the stuff. You know, there was a computer that we shipped where uh, the speaker's magnet was right next to the hard drive. Now, when you played a sound, it caused the hard drive's read-write head to misalign. So in the midst of like playing your QuickTime movie, your computer would completely freeze because it played a sound. And I'm like, what kind of engineers do we have around here that would put a magnet right next to your hard drive? Jesus Christ, it's just, a, it beeped and it crashed, you know? And then they wanted me, believe it or not, this is the solution, they wanted me to change the decibels of the speaker so that it wouldn't interfere with the hard drive. I mean, you're kidding me. That's classic. See, you know, engineers are retarded. They have some kind of brain damage that allows them to not have social skills so that they could concentrate long enough to write code. But it's a disease. That's why I had to quit. I mean, I'm like an engineer in recovery. I'm, you know, I don't want to write code anymore. It just makes you retarded. I mean, get a girlfriend. Get a life. There were times when it was when it was more difficult, you know, when Microsoft was at its strongest. You know, when I think about comparing Microsoft and Apple, <clears throat> I think about the basic values of the company being almost diametrically opposed. They have managed to distinguish themselves as the company that isn't Microsoft. And I think there is a lot of Mac users who choose to use a Mac for that reason, that it isn't a Windows machine. I've used Windows to the extent that I've had to use Windows. And I just cannot understand <laughs> some stuff there. I've hated Windows for a number of years and I could never figure out why. And about three years ago, it finally hit me that the reason I hated it was because it always makes me feel stupid. I go to do something and it gives me a warning that I don't understand, it's cryptic. But, uh, you know, Microsoft was one of the first big developers for Apple. I mean, they made a fortune developing software for Apple and, and also for the Mac. I mean, they're one of the first big Mac developers as well. As far as the PC users and Mac users being compared, I really feel that there is a lot of give and take in the PC users world, but that the PC users really get off on how complicated it is. It makes them feel superior when they sit down with somebody and totally confuse them. And, you know, not every PC user is like that, but the ones that I have talked to basically just love to rattle on technical information at a mile a minute because it makes them look good. Everything that you know went into Office, I think, were initially purchased from other companies and developed for the, the Mac, and then, of course, you know, rolled into Windows. And then they, you know, I mean, Bill Gates saw the, the uh, Mac uh, operating system was the way to go, and Windows, you know, 3.1 borrowed heavily from that, and then Windows 95, 10 years later, the rest is history. who really needs little introduction. <laughs> after all, after all, Steve Jobs has been around since the very first Macintosh. So please join with me now and welcome from Apple Computer, Steve Jobs. <laughs> During the last several weeks, we have looked at some of the relationships, and I'd like to uh, announce one of our first partnerships today, a very, very meaningful one, and that is one with Microsoft. One of the things that I hear over and over again, always from Windows people, of course, is that Microsoft saved Apple from certain doom by giving them $150 million. Well, if you look at the whole story, Steve negotiated agreement where 
Microsoft agreed to produce Office for another five years. Apple wasn't going to compete with them. At the same time, Microsoft made an investment of $150 million in Apple stock that particular day. Uh, that served two purposes. One, it made it look like Microsoft was confident in Apple's uh, survival because they wouldn't have bought stock if they didn't. Um, and secondly, it kind of cemented the agreement that you know, we're, we're not only sure you're going to be successful with this product, we're going to back it up by buying some stock, so we're, we're part of it. We're not only a competitor in producing software, we're a partner in owning stock. Um, what most people don't tell you is that they didn't need the money for Microsoft to survive. This was all a marketing game, and a lot of Windows people don't understand that. Microsoft didn't save Apple. And if we want to move forward and see Apple healthy and prospering again, we have to let go of a few things here. We have to let go of this notion that for Apple to win, Microsoft has to lose. Okay? We have to embrace the notion that for Apple to win, Apple has to do a really good job. companies very successful and what makes companies fail is the same thing it's sort of the passionate adherence to a strategy people who are passionately involved in the concept of philosophy a design a product all right will put everything of themselves into it and you don't want somebody designing a product who isn't passionate about it innovation is um it's really the only interesting thing. What, if you're not innovating, uh, what's the point? When Apple creates through engineering something very cool that people want to buy, it does well. And when it doesn't, it doesn't. So, you know, guess what? Newton didn't succeed. Apple III didn't succeed. Lisa didn't succeed. If you stand back and you look at the Macintosh, the Macintosh line, everything they implement into their computers has personality. It's, it's like the difference between owning a, uh, a Ferrari versus owning, you know, just a, a Ford Taurus. You know, it's sleeker style design, it's, it's fun to drive, you know, versus one that you just use to get to work. So Macintosh was the mega hit, but what was the first company that really made CD-ROM drives on every computer? Guess what? It was Apple. Guess who democratized 802.11? Airport and Apple, right? And so, how about Firewire? Who made that a standard? How about USB? Some companies can think you can innovate too fast uh, because you don't uh, sort of milk the cash cow to the maximum before moving on. That's not the way Apple usually thinks. So after a while, it's not just a big hit, it's also, you know, you could say that these these revolutions were caused by little uprisings that Apple's, you know, made made successful. The mouse. Now, someone could say, well, Park had the mouse and all that, but you know what? Park didn't make it a commercial success. Apple sort of, at, and it basically comes from both Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, they, they, they don't really care about that. Sure, they want to make money, but that's not what it's about. It's artistic values. Apple wants to do the greatest thing possible. They don't compare themselves to someone else. Who cares about it? Other people can do great things too. That's great. It's more like um, you know, being transcendently brilliant. How could, no matter how well you've done it, how can you make it better? I would like to hear what 
Jonathan Ive would say. His design is so inspired. It, it's like it's divine providence or something. He has a team of like phenomenally talented people and they keep working on a problem until they come up with something fresh and, and, and new, you know, like the scroll wheel on the iPod or that Luxo looking iMac. If you look at what Apple does, after it does it, one thing you always have to say is, how come nobody else did this before? You know, the colored iMacs changed, changed design in everything. You know, like even on the lids of PowerBooks, you know, they open up very smoothly because they have this weird counter balancing system. And no one is ever going to see this. It's not something that consumers will actually go out and buy. So wouldn't you think that some of these computer companies would say, aha, Apple does well because it has beautiful products. So how much could the most expensive industrial designer in the world cost? You know, a million dollars a year in salary? Two million dollars a year? Five million dollars? That's what makes these products so beautiful. That level of commitment and dedication to the thing, to make it the best thing possible. I'll tell you what, I'll take you to Fry's and I will show you lines of crap. Ugly portables, ugly towers, ugly monitors, ugly MP3 players. Why is that? I guess in a sense it proves the point that these people don't know what to steal. They don't know what to steal. They seem to be all kinds of different people. You think that you know, the, the prototypical Mac users seem to be like the, the graphic designer, you know, who lives in New York or San Francisco, who's liberal, uh, you know, young, sort of hip. You know, there's a lot of different uh, age groups, a lot of different uh, income brackets, a lot of people who end a lot of different jobs, a lot of uh, different professions. Although Apple would like you to think that everybody's a young buck that's 20 years old and has a Mac, the truth is most of the user group members are between 55 and 100 years old. Well, I think the Apple community has stayed remarkably consistent. It's people who love good engineering, they love product design, they love being different, no pun intended, they love probably being the underdog. But then you ask marketers, you know, like there's some of these marketing guys and they're, and they're convinced that Apple is a brand and it conjures up brand associations of creativity and liberty, freedom, and that people are buying into the brand the way they buy a Coke, you know, it, or a beer or a car or a pair of sneakers. It says something about them and their personality. You know, so I think people might be a little more attracted to the the rebelliousness of, of it. I mean, you're the anti-crowd anyway because you don't have a PC, right? For a lot of people, it's a revelation when they go to Macworld to see all these other Mac users. I mean, it's amazing. They, they never knew all these people were out there. Yeah, actually, I went to my first Macworld this, this year, which turned out to be a really one good one to go to since that was when they introduced the iPhone. So actually, what I want to do is switch over to Danny. Hey, Danny. Still people there? take their vacations at Macworld. That'll, that'll be like a week's vacation just to go to Macworld. Uh, probably 15th. I missed last year and Janet and I, my wife, we, we really regretted it because we really like coming here and, and meeting with people. You know, I've seen people show up um, with these, they'll buy these giant suitcases, these huge suitcases, you know, the ones on wheels, empty, just for all the crap they're going to collect at, the, at Macworld, all the leaflets and the free beers and the buttons. I did get my t-shirt, yeah. That I made sure of. It's like being on a the casino floor at Las Vegas, you know, without the cigarette smoke or the drinks. So you're horribly sober and people are barging into you and screaming and shrieking. Yeah. You know, I've been at Macworld and um, Jobs will whip out, you know, some new machine. I'm like, God, I've got to have that machine. Even though I've already got six computers, 
I've got to have that one that he's just unveiled. Why? Because it's faster or it's got a silver case or it's got, you know, Bluetooth built in or something just crazy and stupid, really. But I got to have that machine. People like us keep the machines around for so much longer. I mean, I don't think PC owners really do that. But, you know, a Mac user, they'll keep, they'll keep an old machine around forever if, they, if it's long as it's still running. We've all got old Macs, like, you can't bear to throw away in the basement or in a cupboard somewhere in the attic. They're kind of hard to part with. You always figure that one day you're going to dust them off and do something with them, and because you never do, they, they just sit rotting away. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that collect them, but there are some, some are more serious than others. Okay, up first is our G3 monitor. Very rare. Uh, when this came in, a friend of mine brought it in. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. I didn't even know that Apple made it, but it was got the Apple logo on it, and it was made for the G3 tower. This is Apple's entry. It's got the Apple logo on it into the portable printer. I started buying a couple of these machines from people I know and then uh, refurbishing them. Here's my 2 Plus that I purchased originally way back when. You know, I repl replaced my Apple 2 Plus with an Apple 2C. And I should have thrown the 2 Plus away, but never did. No, this is like our conference room that is, uh, I ran out of space to fix my laptop, so I started fixing them in here. I didn't want to see a nice room go to waste, so I'll put more stuff in it. In education, this is prob probably one of the biggest ones. These microzines, looks like a magazine and a diskette. There's my 20th anniversary and everybody's favorite, the Cube. Here's a cool machine, Mac Mini. They, uh, they hit a home run when they made this. All right, here's, here's something that's three and a half inch discuts, still shrink wrapped. They have the old, old, old Apple logo. Apple's had several different logos over the years, and that's one of the old ones. Anything interesting over here? No. And then I bought a 2E, and I bought a 2E with a numeric keypad, and I should have been throwing these things away, but never did. So maybe that was my training. Junk. It's a, it's a long name for junk. Back here, we uh, made some kind of attempt at putting things on shelves, dual drives, Apple five and a quarters, Apple three and a halves, some Apple printers, Apple keyboards, Apple mice, original boxes that are empty that uh, just ain't got the heart to throw away. Just don't fill my butt as I'm going up here. Oh, I won't, I won't. <laughs> okay, we're in the bowels of the building. Up in the rafters, there was too much nice space up here that we didn't want to waste, so we built little shelves so we could put all our two E's, two pluses. And it looks like critters have been up here because some have fallen down on the uh, insulation. Apple II monitors, GS monitors, and every single one works. They were tested before we put them up here. Uh, back here is a uh, storage shed. It was meant to um, hold the things that were in my basement. And luckily, uh, we built it a little bit bigger than what I intended. Bella Howells. These things are going on eBay. I've seen them as high as six, seven hundred bucks. It's not ever been a money issue on collecting or disposing of the apples. It's uh, probably a sickness that I have. <laughs> and I have uh, the 128 Mac in hiding. A lot of the SEs, SE30s, classics. Only a couple color classics. 6,000 square feet building, and uh, this, is, this is only maybe uh, less than half of what I have. There are probably other Mac people out there, same boat as I am, that just won't throw this stuff away. 
so I'm starting to see all these complaints about cult of Mac. What are they? It's not a cult, you know. This is a rational choice. And these are all these new Windows people that have just come on board, uh, you know, and are sort of defensive about it a little still because they, there are other Windows friends who haven't crossed over yet. You know, there's that Macintosh cult following. You don't get a following like that for nothing, you know. You get um, if it's a good product and it makes people excited. I think that's the, you can have lots of good products. There are lots of good products out there. You know, I got a skillet, it's really good. But you know, I don't, I'm not crazy about the skillet. Well, it's always been, it's always been kind of interesting. Um, it, there's, there's definitely a fanatical sort of zealotry of, of Mac people, you know. Um, it's not a religion, it's a computer. I got a lawnmower too, but I don't sit around talking about it, you know. Yeah, I mean, so I cut my grass, whatever, you know. I, I type a Word document, it's a screwdriver or it's a blender, you know, like whatever. You know, I'm not really in love with my Mac. I like a good movie more than I do a good Mac, you know. I like good beverages more than my computer. I, I watched the rumor sites like a hawk, and, and I, I, I was a little more lucky this time, because when I, my blue and white G3, I, we, we got it, and then the G4 came out two weeks later, it's like, what? Look how they're suing bloggers now, you know, for revealing some details about a very insignificant product. Although it's been a problem that has, you know, plagued the company, I guess it's kind of rumor control. I get between 2,500 and 3,000 unique visitors a day, um, and which is, you know, for the fact that I'm just putting up goofy little jokes about a computer company, I think that's pretty good. <laughs> I was a pretty avid reader of rumor sites for a long time, and, you know, usually, I mean, pretty much through the late part of the 90s, and um, constantly, you know, checking out what Apple was going to do next and that kind of thing. and, and and then it sort of hit me that I think around the time that one of them predicted that there was going to be a crank powered iBook, that these guys didn't necessarily know what they were talking about. I think they also just got worse at when Steve Jobs came back because he cracked down on the leaks that were going out to these sites. And so they were probably actually better during the mid 90s. They were probably more accurate. Well, I mean, it really, you know, I didn't start out with any goal other than I just found myself writing these things anyway and I wanted a place to publish them. Um, so there was no grand plan in mind. Uh, I never thought that I was going to make any money doing it and I do manage to actually make at least a little bit of money <laughs> doing it. it. Keeps me off the streets. The, the idea of a startup sound was was from the Apple II. The Apple II, uh, once it reset, made a little beep uh, with the square root speaker. So we thought that's a, was a great idea. It lets the computer know it's all, let lets the world know it made it, like an infant's first cry. The very first one we did for the earliest Mac prototypes, uh, we had a square wave sound generator built into the early Mac prototypes. We later got rid of that. So I made a, a thing that con incremented the frequency with, uh, you know, I tweaked the delay so it made a whooping sound. So the, the first original boot sound was more like something like, whoop, <laughs> or whatever. And it was, it, it was, it was a little comical, uh, but it wasn't very elegant. And so I was experimenting with different things for the boot sound, but a guy named Charlie Kellner had just joined the Mac team, who was also a brilliant musician, and he had actually designed one of the first uh, PC-based synthesizers called the Alpha Centauri uh, for the Apple II, was an accomplished musician. And he kind of looked what I was doing, messing around with different boot sounds. I guess for the period of time I was doing it, everyone could just hear it. You know, trying this, trying that. And he said, oh, he had an algorithm he always wanted to use. Uh, and that made a chiming bell-like sound. Uh, it was in the Mac, you know, starting in 1984, and it lasted up until the Mac II, where once again uh, they put in even more sophisticated sound hardware, and they came up with a different sound that uh, I wasn't involved with. 
Well, the startup sound, let me think. Well, the main inspiration was how horrible the one on the Mac II was. So a tritone is the most dissonant sound you can imagine, and stack four of them together. And, uh, and that was the sound that you heard when you turned on the Mac, which was horrible. And so um, I set out trying to change that because it didn't make any sense, especially when you usually hear the startup sound after it crashed. And so I'm like, great, reward for a crash. So the, the sound that I wanted to do turned out to be politically a challenge. No one wanted to change it. They thought of it as the brand. And there was this new machine that we were building at the time called the Quadra. And the Quadra was going to have um, better speakers. And then I'm like, great, horrible sound on better speakers. And so I started working on new sounds that would be the sound of um, well, I kind of thought of it as, what's the palate cleanser for a crash? And then unfortunately what happened was, no one wanted to change the sound. We ended up just doing it. And um, after that, everybody changed the startup sound with every new ROM, which was exactly the opposite problem. You can't establish a brand if you keep changing your logo with every product release. And so, you know, these, these sonic logos or ear cons were, you know, that should be a recognizable sound. Right about the same time Steve Jobs came back, um, I heard, the story I heard was, uh, he had said, let's go back to that good sound, and, and, I, and that was the one that I had done, and so it's still been there. It's the same one, it's the only one that's ever been there since. So, I mean, it's kind of cool to hear it every time. I mean, I'm, I never really think about it, like, you know, millions of people crashing and hearing me play the C major chord. No, it's a widespread C major chord with a uh, high E, I think, in the upper voice, which to me just sounds more bright and sort of unresolved, but happy. It's a happy chord. It's way better than a tritone. One psychologist said that, um, you know, people form a social relationship with their machine. It becomes like a friend, you know, it's, it becomes personalized. You know, it seems a little silly, but you kind of build up a relationship with your computer. And it can either be a good relationship or it can be a dysfunctional relationship. And you can customize any, any computer system, but these are very easy to develop a relationship with that's different from customizing. They're the closest devices that I know of that are really symbiotic. And I'll admit it, you know, when they, uh, when they do make it so that you can kind of jack in neurally, I'll do that. Their soul is somehow reflected in, in that machine. You know, it's a, an object of, of communication, but also of creativity. You know, the most essential things that, it, that they are, the things that express themselves, are expressed through the computer. And so they invest, you know, so much in that, that it, it, it's a cybernetic relationship. When Steve came back, he was like, hey, you know, we should get into this music thing. I mean, he, he saw it, but to me it was like five years late, like that was obvious five years earlier. I think Apple could be as big as Sony right now if it had been five years earlier. A phone, finally? Whatever. Uh, a couple of years ago when they, Apple said it was going to come through with some breakthrough device, there was a lot of speculation about what this might be. A lot of people figured it was a music player, but exactly what it was going to be, no one knew. And people were saying on the forums they were going to buy it anyway. It didn't matter. They were going to get it because it was going to be fucking great. The iPod people have, have the iPods in their pocket mainly because they love music. And that's, um, and as do the Apple employees who created it. And people complain about it, but it's the fact that they were able to make the iPod is actually why, you know, one of the reasons why Macs are still around. <laughs> it's only really clear when you compare it to other products that are a pain in the ass to use. I mean, they are impossible. There are more iPods in my house than there are people by probably two to one. 
but I never use an iPod. I have <laughs> five. <laughs> I think I have five, or we have five. The family has five, I think. You know, that's like this whole video thing on your iPod. Who cares? I thought we used to complain about postage stamp movies. I mean, that was a complaint we had 16 years ago, and it's Back to the Future. Let's complain about. I got this iPod. What am I? Just... A movie on an iPod. I don't even get it. Like, you think how long can I hold this up in front of my face before my arm gets tired? I mean, I can't even get through one TV sitcom. Progress. A big part of Apple's uh, marketing uh, budget was like sticking the machines in movies and TV shows, you know, so it culminated with, um, uh, what was it called, um, Independence Day, when the power book, you know, taps into the alien computer and uh, blows up the alien ship. Um, they paid you know, tens of millions of dollars, I believe, to do that. And this is like when product placement was starting to become big business in Hollywood. So, um, but since then, you know, you see, you see them all over the place. I mean, they, they are all over TV. And that has a lot, you know, part of it is product placement, part of it is because Macs are popular in Hollywood, you know, obviously they're used for video editing. I've edited uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 movies, television, theatrical movies. Uh, no documentaries. Well, start with my calling card, Rocky, down out in Beverly Hills, Beaches, American Gigolo, um, Sister Act, um, The Net, Payday, my, one of my favorite movies. I was a very successful film editor, editing mechanically with German machines, cams, uh, was, Steenbeck's, Moviolas, uh, whatever, everything you can imagine, every piece of mechanical equipment you can imagine I used. Well, I wanted to move forward into computers, but believe it or not, they were reluctant to. They, they still thought it was cheaper to edit the old mechanical way. Well, I had, I'd experiment around with the Lucas system, the Laserdisc system, that thing seemed was ridiculous. The montage, that was ridiculous. And uh, the light works, that was, it was sort of starting to happen. And basically, it wasn't until 1995, which was late in the game, and mostly at, at that point, uh, early 90s, it was, the, you know, the avid. I went and I had to do a picture, a Columbia picture, a Sandra Bullock picture called The Net. It had a very short post-production schedule. I had no experience, had no idea what I was doing. Within three hours, I had the basic principles down. So it was, it, it, was, it was a good system. I continued editing on that s system for, for at least seven, eight years. And then I jumped, to, jumped into Final Cut. And I've been editing in Final Cut, you know, ever since. I mean, uh, it's an amazing, uh, amazing system. Take a simple film like Edward Scissorhands. We were editing mechanically. I was editing with my wife. Well, we went to location with four cams. I was editing, she was editing, and then we had a husband and wife team. They were our assistants. So there was four of us, and that was really economical. And we had four editing machines, and we were able to keep up with camera. And we were able to get a Christmas release and do the movie quite quickly. With this system, I'm pretty much a one-man band and my assistant. I can do the job of six or seven editors in the old system. Well, you can see, I mean, I mean, look at the environment now. Instead of editing in 1,200 square feet, I can edit in 200 square feet. Apple is Steve Jobs, for sure. I mean, he is the one who defines the company. He founded it, but I mean, look at its recent history. It, 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 he has his personality stamped all over it. I used to say about Steve that he was the best person uh, possible to work for and also the worst, uh, because he's a, a man of extremes. Steve's extremely passionate. He's incredibly sharp. 
Uh, he's more than anything else incredibly quick. He's got the quickest mind of anyone I've ever talked to. Yeah, I mean, I, I idolize Steve Jobs. He's absolutely, you know, one of my, he's, a, he's like my favorite celebrity, but I, I don't pretend to think that I would understand what would come out of his mouth if I asked him the question. I cannot explain how Steve comes up with these things because he has a different operating system. And so mere mortals cannot understand him. So that's why when people try to understand him and you know his quirks and all that, they get very frustrated because you can't, it would be like telling a fish how to understand how a bird feels flying. It cannot be. The fish is stuck in the water, the bird is soaring. It's a different operating system. That's what it is. I think Apple is his place in the world. This is where it all began. And obviously, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a piece of himself. It's a company that seems like it needs somebody who's not just your ordinary CEO to run it. They tried a number of ordinary CEOs in the 90s and it just didn't work. Because if you look at uh, the time era that Jobs was not there, Apple fell into a category where their, their Macs were just becoming like everyday computers and there was nothing special about them. But of course, Steve, Steve Jobs has an incredibly strong aesthetic, in, in case you can't tell. I don't think you could change the DNA of Apple if you tried. So Apple's DNA is in, in building cool stuff. It's an engineering company. They can say they're marketing and all that, but you know, a marketing-driven company is a company that theoretically listens to the market and deliver what the market says it wants. <laughs> that, you could say many things about Apple, but that ain't one of them, okay? They don't listen to anybody. Apple's idea of market research is, you know, Steve's right hemisphere is connected to his left hemisphere. That's the focus group. Immediately when Jobs came back, first thing he did was the iMac. He set the personality, he set the tone of the computer. He's like, here, we're going to break boundaries, we're going to take, the, we're going to take it to the next level, the next edge. You could make the case that Apple III wasn't his, <laughs> and Newton wasn't his, and uh, Lisa wasn't his. So the only time it flubbed or stubbed its toe was when, Apple, when Steve wasn't behind it. I don't see Apple being able to continue at the pace that it's going right now. I mean, I don't expect it to suddenly, you know, fumble and fall, but it's not going to be what it is now. Now, the, the problem is going to be the post Steve, if you bring in some dickhead who thinks that he's mini Steve and he too is a visionary and he too understands what people need but cannot express. So dick, this dickhead is going to say, all right, so this is what I've decreed people will want and I'm the new Steve Jobs. <laughs> the company will implode. That depends on whether or not the philosophy employed by Steve in focusing on product and having a passionate view of the product and its relationship to the rest of the operating enterprise. If they get somebody like that in there, then it will continue as an ever-growing, ever-expanding, ever-creative enterprise. Well, the, the story, and I don't know if it's true, but when you went into the HP lobby, there was H's portrait and P's portrait, right? And when Carly came in, she put her portrait, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm coming to, right? I mean, if you hire some dickhead who does that, it's game over, baby. We'll all be listening to Zunes and, win and using Windows machines. If they get a bottom line man in there, it may succeed, but it will never have the aura and the passion that it has today. You can trace the greatness of Apple uh, pretty closely back to the greatness of Steve. Uh, some of the flaws of Apple as well. I can't build a case that it's it's going to be easy to find another Steve Jobs. It may not be that um, you want another Steve Jobs because there can be no other Steve Jobs. The Macintosh spirit was not something 
uh, we created with the Macintosh, although we, we, we sort of contributed to it, but it was there before the Macintosh because it's really the spirit of the Apple II. And so, so, so much of the spirit of the Apple II is the spirit of Steve Wozniak's personality as well as Steve Jobs's. Yeah, the core of Apple is to change the world. And that has not changed. I don't think it can. I don't think it could change if you tried to change it. And in a broader sense, though, some of that spirit of the Apple II was the spirit of the personal computer revolution. And really, what that is more than anything else is uh, the uh, celebration of unbounded possibility. Uh, the key thing, those, those first microcomputers, even pre-Apple II, but even the Apple IIs, couldn't really do much. Yet they were incredibly exciting because you knew they were the seed that would change the world. And if you look at Steve and Woz, what they did is they created Apple One, which was it changed the world. Apple Two changed the world. Macintosh changed the world. iPod changed the world, and maybe this phone will change the world. So you know that's five things. You can't call that luck. We filled the machine with our love and passion for what we were doing, and it radiates out on the other side of the screen and affects the user. The commercial was great. The commercial was fantastic. I then edited Pirates of Silicon Valley many years later and the movie started off with that same commercial. Oh. Well. Oh my. Oh God, not, not a problem. Oh shit. For one thing, I'm living proof. If you do one thing right in your career, you can coast for a long time. <laughs> a long time. Do you think Steve Jobs is going to be willing to sit down and talk to us. Sit down and talk to you? No. <laughs> well, I did want to tell you this, but Steve was in here about four months ago and spent spent part of a day, about three hours here. But I, I'll make a prediction, and my prediction is you will not talk to Steve Jobs for this documentary. No, that's good. That's not bad. <laughs> probably, probably would say no. That depends on the mood he's in when you try to talk to him. If you hit him on a good day, uh, it's come on in, come down, we'll go to dinner. I mean, half the time he's not willing to sit down and talk to CNN at that. If you get him on a bad day, it's, uh, sorry, I haven't got time for this. <laughs> Presuming you don't go skidding down the stairs in your hindquarters. The only way you could hook him would be to show him some of the film. I, I call him up and he asked him to come visit when he had a chance. You're, you're fibbing, of course. I am fibbing. Steve will Steve Steve will not talk to the New York Times usually. Yeah, right. So a, it might be better even if you didn't have him. It might be better if you had you had a like a cloak figure behind the background and <laughs> you know what I mean. And this was the mysterious Jobs, you know. I shouldn't tell you this, but he lives walking distance from here. You could go go stake out the house. <laughs> no, he'd probably call on us or something. Yeah, he probably would. <laughs>